Um, should we start? Uh, I think it's uh, on time. Um, uh, good evening. Uh, uh, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, this is a standard greetings uh, these days. Uh, um, I want to welcome everyone to conference on ocean laws and policy entitled Peaceful Maritime Engagement in East Asia and the Pacific Region. Um, this is a second panel on navigational rights and law enforcement. I believe uh, we are going to discuss uh, interaction between navigational rights and uh, law enforcement SC. We have uh, four panelists uh, addressing different aspects of the subject. Uh, without uh, any delay, I just want to proceed immediately to the first panelist. Uh, first panelist is Dr. David Goddard assistant legal advisor of United Kingdom's Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, he will address the applicability of human rights treaties in maritime law enforcement. May I invite Dr. Bodar? Thank you, Judge Pack, for uh, that uh, introduction. And thank you to the sponsors of the uh, conference for the kind invitation to uh, speak today. Um, something I should uh, say up front is that my comments are uh, very much my own. Um, certainly shouldn't be taken to be the views of the UK or the uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, as you've heard, I'll be talking about the uh, uh, applicability of human rights treaties in uh, maritime law enforcement. And to be clear, when I refer to human rights treaties, I'm referring principally to the treaties that contain rights arguably most relevant to law enforcement, uh, the right to life, uh, freedom from torture and other forms of uh, cruel or inhuman treatment or punishment, as well as other key civil rights, such as uh, freedoms of assembly and expression. So uh, in terms of treaties, that means the International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights, or uh, ICCPR, as well as the key regional instruments, um, including the American, uh, European, and African conventions. Um, in looking at the uh, applicability of these instruments to uh, maritime law enforcement, I want to cover three, three main areas. First, to explain why this matters, why the question whether or not human rights treaty obligations apply to a given operation is significant, uh, particularly given the normative framework already provided by the law of the sea. Uh, second, I want to briefly recap the basic principles according to which uh, applicability of human rights treaties is determined focusing uh, on their extraterritorial um, applicability. And finally, I'll try to explain why the application of these principles in the context of uh, maritime law enforcement is especially difficult. Um, I should add, in the time available, this will necessarily be um, a fairly high level discussion. Um, my aim is very much to look across the wave tops and uh, sketch out the key issues. So turning first to the question, uh, why it matters whether human rights treaties apply to maritime law, uh, law enforcement. I think there are two, two main reasons. First of all, it can provide uh, mechanisms through which a state's conduct can be scrutinized, including for some states, the possibility of complaints brought by individuals. And second, the application of human rights law entails additional substantive obligations. Over and, ab um, over and above those that arise under other bodies of law, including the law of the sea. With respect to the first of these reasons, I think a good example is presented by um, obligations related to the rescue of individuals at risk of being lost at sea, um, a subject which has been particularly prominent in uh, discussion around uh, tragic events of, uh, involving uh, irregular migrants in the Mediterranean and, and elsewhere. Um, Although a very wide array of uh, relevant obligations arise under the law of the sea, so including under the SAR and SOLAS conventions, as well as under UNCLOS um, and customary law, 
it's through communications and cases uh, brought before human rights courts and uh, supervisory bodies that states' conduct is being brought under scrutiny. Reflected, for example, in recent decisions by the Human Rights Committee in response to uh, communications brought by individuals uh, involving Italy and Malta. I think it is important to acknowledge that the situation does differ between states. So while there are 173 state parties to the, to the uh, ICCPR, only 116 are also parties to the optional protocol under which individual communications are permitted. Even with, with uh, respect to interstate communications, which are provided for under the uh, uh, ICCPR itself, states must have made the uh, uh, necessary declaration to permit that. And while many states are also party to uh, regional conventions, which typically provide for some form of individual communication, and which in some cases uh, may lead to binding judgments, that is far from universal, including among, um, among some very prominent nations. So there is considerable diversity from those states whose actions may be the subject of cases brought by individuals before a regional commission or court, as well as the Human Rights Committee, to those states which supervision of their compliance is solely through periodic uh, review mechanisms. However, while those sorts of uh, uh, re uh, review mechanisms are not really comparable to a judicial process resulting in a, bind in a, in a, in a binding judgment, they can nevertheless result in really very sig politically significant criticism. And in any case, states must implement their treaty obligations in good faith which brings us to the additional substantive norms that arise under human rights law. And there really is time here only to, to skim the surface, but to, to take an example, uh, the right to life under human rights law imposes significant additional obligations on states when they use force in the course of uh, law enforcement, over and above those that arise under the law of the sea. So although it's already uh, well established that the law of the sea requires uh, the use only of proportionate force, for example, requiring a gradual escalation of force to uh, affect an interdiction. Human rights treaty obligations not only require that force be uh, necessary and proportionate, but require, for example, that force be authorised and uh, regulated by law, that it be planned and perhaps even uh, uh, resourced to minimise the risk to life, that personnel using force are adequately trained and that potential violations are adequately investigated. Human rights treaties include numerous other obligations relevant to how states conduct maritime law enforcement uh, activity, such as those relating to deprivation of liberty and the prohibition of uh, non refoulement But they also contain obligations relevant to whether such activity is lawful in the first place and with which such activity may be in tension, so particularly freedoms of expression or uh, freedom of um, uh, uh, assembly. Without going into detail, I think it should be clear that the applicability of human rights treaties brings with it an extensive and complex set of obligations over and above those that would um, otherwise arise. So hopefully that sets the scene with, with respect to why the applicability of human rights treaties is, is important in this context. Turning to the question of how applicability is determined, it's important to acknowledge that this is an exceptionally complex and vexed question, especially the issue of uh, ex um, extraterritorial um, uh, applicability. And in, in particular, I'm going to steer clear of the specific issue of the uh, United States position on the um, extraterritorial applicability of um, its uh, human rights obligations. However, at the very highest level, the applicability of the ICCPR, as well as that of the regional instruments I've uh, 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 referred to, turns on the existence of a jurisdictional link between the state and the individuals to which that state owes human rights obligations. However, as is well known, jurisdiction in this context has a meaning that cannot be determined simply and solely by reference to its meaning elsewhere in international law. Such traditional concepts are relevant. Human rights treaties generally apply throughout a state's territory, and thus their territorial seas and internal waters, as well as onboard ships flying that state's flag. But extraterritorial applicability can arise more generally where states exercise sufficient control over either areas or individuals outside their territory. The precise context of these uh, threshold conditions at the centre of the controversy um, surrounding extraterritorial applicability. The former effective control over an area is generally interpreted as setting a relatively high threshold 
likely requiring sufficient control to fulfill the full gamut of rights. However, the latter, control over individuals, has proven rather more flexible. Although there are commonalities, approaches to the personal model of jurisdiction have evolved differently in each human rights system and can be complex. For example, the uh, uh, European Court of Human Rights has recognised that a jurisdictional link can arise through the exercise by state agents of de facto authority and control over individuals. However, while, it had, uh, while it's had no trouble in finding that standard to be met in the case of individuals detained by state agents, it has struggled with whether the use of force in itself can amount to authority and control and has resorted to introducing novel concepts such as the exercise of public powers in order to explain why some uses of force are sufficient and others are not. Its, its uh, approach has been criticised, not unreasonably for its seeming arbitrariness, but the contortions in its reasoning arguably reflect the challenges, legal, practical and political, that would follow from finding the uh, uh, European Convention to apply in some of the situations in which it's been raised by claimants, particularly the use of force in armed conflict. The recent decision in the case brought by Georgia against Russia demonstrates that the court is really yet to resolve these issues adequately. In contrast, the Human Rights Committee is increasingly embracing what has been described as a functional approach. This is especially evident in its uh, General Comment 36 on the right to life, in which the committee stated that uh, effective control over individuals, such as would entail application of rights under the uh, uh, ICCPR, includes persons located outside any territory effectively controlled by the state, whose right to life is nonetheless impacted by its military or other activities in a direct and reasonably for, uh, foreseeable manner. In other words, if a state's actions can be reasonably foreseen directly to affect the right in question, then the state obligations are engaged with respect to that right. Although perhaps avoiding some of the arbitrary line drawing that arises under other approaches, this is an extremely expansive um, approach to the, to the issue. It would draw into the scope of human rights obligations areas of conduct, such as the use of force and armed conflicts that may cause significant concern for states and courts alike. It's also important to note that a common and necessary feature of these approaches to personal jurisdiction um, uh, is that a, a applicability can arise with respect to only specific rights, uh, something referred to as dividing and tailoring in the, in the language of the Strasbourg Court. Hence, it's no objection to the idea that an individual is entitled to freedom from arbitrary detention to argue that the state concerned uh, doesn't exercise enough control over that individual to fulfil other rights. As we'll see, it's the application of these principles of extraterritorial applicability, particularly with respect to control over individuals, that's especially difficult, I think, in the context of maritime law enforcement. So turning to that, that, that question, the uh, applicability of human rights treaties, specifically to maritime law enforcement, we can start off by making some relatively uncontroversial propositions. First, human rights treaties will generally apply in a state's own territorial sea and, and internal waters on the basis that they apply throughout uh, state's own territory. The same logic doesn't, however, extend to other zones seaward of the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone, or other areas defined by the law of the sea, such as a state's uh, search and rescue zone. If human rights treaties are to apply in those zones, it will need to be on some other basis. Second, it's fairly, un uh, fairly uncontroversial that human rights treaties will generally apply on ships that fly a state's flag. Um, this is, as I've said, a specific instance of extraterritorial, uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, that has been recognised repeatedly in case law. Um, as a consequence, for example, human rights treaty obligations will be engaged uh, where individuals are brought onto a state's vessel. So that was the case um, in the case of Hersey Jamar, considered by the European Court, which involved the transfer of uh, irregular migrants onto Italian Navy vessels, with the result that the prohibition on uh, uh, refoulement applied with respect to those individuals. And finally, it's uncontroversial that uh, maritime law enforcement operations may entail certain discrete actions that are well established as meeting the threshold of control over individuals such that human rights treaty obligations will apply. And I think the clearest example is probably that of detention, where a state agents physically detain individuals during the course of a law enforcement operation. Um, 
then just as in any other um, extraterritorial exercise of state power, that will amount to sufficient control over the individual such that relevant obligations will apply. So most notably in that case, those that relate to freedom from arbitrary detention. However, having exhausted these relatively straightforward scenarios, we're left with, I think, two much more difficult questions. First, when, if ever, will a state exercise effective control over an area of water beyond its territorial sea, such that human rights treaties will apply throughout that area um, on the basis of that control? And second, um, probably more importantly, when in the course of extraterritorial maritime law enforcement operations, outside of the clear-cut situations like detention, will a state exercise sufficient control over individuals um, such that human rights treaty obligations will apply? Um, I should make clear that I'm certainly not going to resolve these questions, but I think it's helpful to sketch out the contours of the issues that are engaged. So on the question of control over an area, there are some obvious candidates for such areas, including zones with some form of legal basis under the law of the sea. For example, a state's exclusive economic zone, its search and rescue zone, or any safety zones uh, it establishes around uh, offshore um, installations. Um, to these can be added some other more uh, ephemeral possibilities. It's been suggested that states may exercise uh, e effective control over areas in which concerted counter piracy operations are being conducted, for example, or that such an area might uh, surround state vessels as they traverse the seas, a sort of moving zone of uh, effective control. However, while these, these suggestions may be superficially attractive, the arguments rarely stack up against the jurisprudence, which generally requires a higher level of control um, than is likely to be achieved at sea, um, a level of control at which a state is able in principle to fulfil the full range of rights arising under a treaty. Against that standard, I don't think it's really plausible that a state could properly be held to exercise effective control over areas as large and over which it enjoys so little authority as an exclusive economic zone and certainly not a search and rescue zone i the, the um i forget the exact size of the uh, uh um, uh, um australian SAR zone but it covers a significant portion of the earth's surface um or even areas of operations on the high seas I wouldn't want to discount the possibility entirely, and I think the standard might conceivably be met, for example, on board a foreign ship that has been seized, or maybe even in very small zones of control, such as safety zones, but I think even that is, is um, somewhat speculative. And as for the idea that a ship carries with it a mobile zone of effective control, if that were true, then why not the same in the case of an individual soldier or tank or plane? Such a possibility would be a really radical departure and more importantly i think conflates the means to exercise control with the actual exercise of that control instead when an individual ship does does exercise control over individuals in its vicinity then just as is the case with respect to individual soldiers i think it's better to look to the personal mode of jurisdiction and it's to that that i'll i'll, I'll now turn for, turn for my final comments um, on the personal mode of jurisdiction, it's uncontroversial that states may exercise sufficient control over individuals in the course of uh, law enforcement operations for human rights treaties to apply. However, the devil is in the detail, the challenge being to determine when exactly in the course of a dynamic and phased operation that the relevant threshold will be crossed. I'm thinking about um, the phases of a typical maritime law enforcement operation. It may start with a with a state becoming of a, uh, becoming aware of a vessel that it wishes to investigate, a ship being sent to do so, making radio contact, perhaps using force to um, uh, compel a boarding, sending a boarding party on board, using force on board, making arrests, uh, moving individuals onto its own ships. So really a very complex sequence of events and it's difficult to determine when in the course of this a state actually exercises sufficient control over, over individuals um, uh, that, that uh, the, the threshold for applicability is crossed and this is the key question because it, because it dictates what obligations a state actually has and thus what it uh, is uh, 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 required to do. And if a state is to discharge its human rights obligations in good faith, it must and must be entitled to know when those obligations arise. Um, and moreover, it needs to know before the fact, not only at the point that its actions subsequently become um, come under scrutiny. 
And I've already said that detention of individuals is sufficient, um, certainly when they're taken abo um, on board an interdicting ship. Um, and I think it's plausible that you could extend that to, and, and with, with uh, some authority, I should add, um, to a situation where another vessel as a whole is placed under, t uh, um, under tow or is otherwise uh, navigating under the orders of another vessel. Um, but prior to that stage, the uh, analysis becomes much more difficult and it's likely to engage controversial questions that I've already mentioned around whether, for example, the use of force alone um, is sufficient to engage human rights obligations. And moving even a step further back, what about the mere passive presence of a uh, state vessel? Is that sufficient to bring those uh, within its uh, vicinity, within its control, such as to establish the uh, jurisdictional link? Um, it's certainly far removed from the conceptions of the personal model endorsed, for example, in the case law of the uh, uh, European system. However, the answer might be different on a functional analysis, particularly in the case of positive obligations, where a failure to act uh, might be argued to give rise to foreseeable interference with an individual's rights. I certainly don't have time to go into detail, but in its recent decision in the case of AS and others in Italy, the presence of an Italian warship um, an hour away from a vessel in distress was one of the factors alongside others, including contact between the vessel and the uh, Italian authorities that contributed to a special relationship of dependency in the language of the uh, committee that meant the vessel was within Italy's jurisdiction for the purposes of the, uh, of the ICCPR. There's much to analyze in that decision and I've only scratched the surface of it. But the point I want to make is that it illustrates just how difficult it currently is for states to understand exactly when their human rights treaties obligations will be engaged. Thresholds that can only be determined after the fact, after careful weighing of wide ranging factors are obviously deeply prob uh, problematic from a practical perspective. And that really is my main point and my closing point. Um, Applicability of human rights obligations is a big deal and uh, maritime law enforcement, given that it often takes place extraterritorially, it's a difficult context in which to apply the established criteria for uh, uh, applicability. Um, and I think my closing comment is just to reflect that we are really a very long way from understanding with clarity where the relevant thresholds lie. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll, I'll hand back to uh, Judge Pack. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Godard. <clears throat> very interesting uh, presentation. Um, uh, each panelist, I forgot to mention this, uh, each panelist uh, has about 20 minutes uh, for your presentation. Uh, I'm sure there will be some questions uh, but uh, we will first listen to the next speaker, uh, Professor Beckman. Uh, he will speak about the um, uh, he will speak about the combating uh, um, where is it? Combating uh, maritime crimes in Southeast Asia. Uh, Professor Beckman, uh, you have about 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, my thanks to you, uh, Judge Peck, for the introduction and thanks to the organizers. I'm going to be looking at a more practical issue, sort of through the eyes of Southeast Asia the issue of combating international maritime crimes. I'm going to attempt to do a good job at sharing the screen. I have some PowerPoints. Uh, is that okay? David, can you see that all right? You're not? Okay. Combating international maritime crimes. I'm looking first from the point of view of, from Southeast Asian perspective, geography matters. I'll talk about that bit on piracy and armed robbery against ships in Southeast Asia, which has been an issue in the past, continues to be an irritant. Third, challenges in combating the piracy and armed robbery in Southeast Asia, the possible applicability of some of the UN counterterrorism conventions, and then some conclusions and recommendations. Geography matters. It matters for in terms of commercial shipping, because if you simply look at a map, you'll see to get from 
Japan, Korea, or China to the Indian Ocean and to Europe, you have to pass through Southeast Asia. And in fact, you have to pass through one of the strategic choke points in Indonesia. Indonesia is a vast archipelago, contains 70,000 islands spread over an area from London to Istanbul or perhaps Ankara. Uh, and it has now under the Nut Convention, uh, archipelagic baselines and archipelagic waters are uh, the light green uh, with its maritime zones measured from the red lines. The three key ch choke points are either the Strait of Malacca and Singapore, which is the major one, but also the Sunda Strait between Sumatra and Java, or the Lombok Strait between the islands of Bali and Java. Now, if you don't go through Indonesia, you have to go all around Australia. That gives you an idea of how long Indonesia is. If you put it on a map of Europe, it extends all the way across to Eastern Turkey. Uh, that's just to give the practical setting. Now, piracy and armed robbery against ships in Southeast Asia. You're starting with the general principles, ships on the high seas subject to exclusive jurisdiction of the flag state, with the one exception, that's still the only exception that exists, uh, piracy as defined in the Law of the Sea Convention, Article 101. Every, every uh, uh, state vessel of every any state may seize a pirate ship and arrest the pirates. Uh, the provision on arrest of pirates also applies on, through Article 58 to uh, pirate attacks in the economic zone. So in effect, it applies anywhere seaward of the outer limit of the territorial sea. Its definition has been around since the 58 convention, uh, illegal act of violence for private ends, crew or passengers of a private ship on the high seas or economic zone against another ship. That's the, generally the issue that we're concerned about. Now, from the point of view of dealing with maritime crimes, you're also up against the issue that state sovereignty in uh, internal waters, territorial sea, and archipelagic waters. So coastal states have the exclusive right to exercise enforcement powers in the maritime zone subject to their sovereignty. Criminal law of the coastal state applies, of course, to all ships and against persons uh, in the maritime zones under their sovereignty. This creates an issue in our neighborhood because you see here a map of Indonesia-Malaysia boundaries. The upper half of the map uh, is the continental shelf boundary, but beginning here at point number one down to Singapore is the territorial sea boundary. So any attack on a ship between, which is basically off main city in, uh, in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, down to Singapore is actually governed by the laws governing territorial sea. There can be no piracy in that act. Similarly, between Singapore and Indonesia and the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, we have a boundary treaty between Singapore and Indonesia, which means any ship passing through there is under the territorial jurisdiction of one of the two neighboring states, and in certain cases between uh, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia. Which means that most of the attacks in the past on shipping, and even today, on ships in Southeast Asia are not piracy. The piracy rules don't apply because they're taking place against ships in the zones under the sovereignty of the coastal state. They're either in archipelagic waters, territorial sea, or internal waters, sometimes in ports. So the concept of armed robbery against ships has been created uh, to develop the address, the question of attacks on ships and waters subject to sovereignty. But, and that concept's consistent with UNCLOS, but in general international law, if you follow the prince, territorial principle of jurisdiction. Now, there was an increase in piracy in uh, Southeast Asia following uh, the early 2000s. One of the results of that was a regional cooperation agreement to combat piracy and armed robbery first regional government-to-government -government 
agreement on this issue. Uh, there's an information sharing center under this agreement located in Singapore. Contracting parties to it are all the ASEAN states except Indonesia and Malaysia, two of the bordering states, as well as East Asian states of Japan, China, Korea, and uh, South Asian states of India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, plus Australia, and then uh, European states, Denmark, Norway, Netherlands, and U UK, and then USA are all parties to this even though it's called a regional agreement, I'm not sure what region B. Uh, agreement provides for cooperation, extradition, and mutual legal assistance, case of arrest, uh, contracting party, again, subject to its national laws. The question, of course, is the states in Southeast Asia, most of whom or all of whom were under colonial domination, except for Thailand, guard their jealousy or their territorial sovereignty very carefully. And therefore, they are very reluctant to enter into any kind of joint patrols. What they have been able to do is have coordinated patrols, but coordinated patrols say, means you stay on your side of the boundary and we'll stay on ours and we'll communicate with each other. They've had eye in the sky where they fly over the state. I'm not sure how many pirates they spotted that way. And they exchange information. If you talk to officers, they have a fairly good uh, cooperation at the operational level between the Coast Guard authorities. And although Indonesia and Malaysia have not actually ratified the RECOP agreement, they do participate in meetings of the Information Sharing Center. Now, some officials in Indonesia don't accept that attacks on ships in their economic zone is piracy. They have trouble understanding that Article 58 brings the piracy rules, makes it applicable. Uh, there's also a feeling among some officials in Indonesia that too much emphasis has been placed on combating attacks on shipping and not enough on issues which they consider far more important, such as trafficking in drugs, trafficking in small arms, illegal, in, you know, illegal immigration, and IIU fishing. Uh, we also Keep in mind that Indonesia has vast waters to patrol. I showed you the map with limited uh, assets in terms of Coast Guard and Navy. And therefore, it has to prioritize between attacks on ships and commercial vessels in the Straits and all the other maritime security issues it has. Uh, so the challenges in combating piracy and armed robbery, I'm going to cover next. Again, this is a map from, our, uh, from the Recap Information Sharing Center from January to April 2021. And you see a list of the incidents in which, minor incidents in which uh, ships have been boarded and supplies or parts have been stolen. But notice where the ship, where again, if you look on the maps, you don't see the boundary between the two countries, but you do see the uh, two lanes traffic separation scheme and the lanes which the ships have to comply with as they pass through the strait. And what you see is most of the boarding of vessels has been in the areas where there is no territorial sea boundary agreement. Here you need an agreement. There is an agreement between in Indonesia and Singapore which stops about here. But when you get out here, we don't know. It's no man's land until we reach an agreement between Indonesia and Malaysia. The Johor is an uh, island of our uh, part of continental uh, West Malaysia, island of Bintang in Malaysia. You're going to have to have an agreement here. There's a dispute on islands and the territorial sea around here among the three countries because Augsburg Lighthouse Island is uh, under the sovereignty of Singapore. Another one of the, of the islands is under the sovereignty of Indonesia, of Malaysia, and they're both very close to the Indonesian islands. So you need a three-party agreement out here. And the bad guys know where the maritime zones are that are uh, 
in dispute and sometimes their activities take place. A couple other incidents here, but normally they're in the area where the boundaries are not clear and sometimes they're in the lane. The uh, eastbound lane is uh, primarily, it's always in the uh, territorial sovereignty of Indonesia. You have a bigger problem this past several years. It's not such a problem now of taking of hostages for ransom by the uh, pirates based in the uh, Philippines in the so-called Sulu Sulawesi Sea area. Again, you have a problem created because of the jurisdictional rules in Southeast Asia. You have boundary here between the Philippines and Indonesia, an economic zone boundary, which recently uh, agreed to. But you have the area up here which is very undefined because the uh, Philippines has a claim to the part of the island or uh, part of Saba, which has uh, been under Malaysia control for a very long time. You don't have agreements here as to exactly where the boundary is and the bad guys often know that. Hostage taking has taken place in that difficult area between the Muslim separatists between East Malaysia and the Philippines. Sometimes the victims are fishermen or commercial uh, vessels from either Indonesia or Vietnam that are traveling in this area. RECAP has come up with some regional guides to help states in the region and help the shipping community. They work very closely with the commercial shipping uh, companies as well. Regional Guide to Counter Piracy and Armed Robbery Against Ships, Guide on the Abduction of Crew in the Sulu Sulubeshi Seas, and a guide for tankers. This was the problem a few years ago. It seems to have been resolved. There were some tankers that are operating that were attacked by pirates for the purpose of oil cargo theft. And I think through investigation, that issue has been resolved. Now, one of the difficulties we've had is the issues of territorial sovereignty and who actually has the jurisdiction and who's willing to exercise it. The other issue that we've been, I've been looking at or our center's been looking at is to what extent might the UN terrorism, so-called terrorism conventions, possibly play a part in controlling some of the illegal activity? UN Office of Counterterrorism lists 19 instruments to prevent terrorist acts. The terrorism label is, I think, unfortunate and misleading because the majority of the 19 instruments don't require what anybody would consider a historic terrorist motive. Offense need not be committed for a political purpose, doesn't need to be committed to create a sense of terror in the population. Uh, Offense can be committed without trying to make a demand on a government or a person to do or refrain from doing any particular act. What all of the counterterrorism conventions have in common is they're all worded almost exactly the same, except they define a different specific criminal offense. Once they define the offense, they then say all parties must make that offense a crime under their laws punishable by serious penalties, must establish jurisdiction over that offense when you have a link to it because it was in your territory, committed by your nationals on a ship flying your flag, etc. But also the key is you must establish jurisdiction based on presence of the offender in your territory. And then if the alleged offender is present in your territory, you have an obligation to take them into custody. And then you have two choices, either prosecute them in your own country or extradite. And the convention can be used as a basis for extradition if there's no special extradition treaty between the two countries concerned. And it also provides for mutual legal assistance in prosecuting the offender. Now, starting with the hijacking of aircraft convention, all of these conventions follow this formula. There are five of them that possibly relate to maritime crimes. I think the first one clearly taking of hostages, those events in the Sulu, 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 Silibi Sea, 
There were actually hostage taking under the 79 convention. Some of the attacks on ships in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore and Southeast Asia generally would also be offenses under the 88 SUA Convention for suppression of unlawful acts against safety of maritime navigation. The threshold there is the perpetrators that board the ship must endanger the safety of the ship. If you come aboard, steal a couple cans of paint and jump back off, you haven't endangered safety, you probably haven't committed an offense. And then if you, then there's conventions relating to fixed platforms, not so important. But the convention on financing of terrorism, if we could find as in the off the case Gulf of Aden, if we could find that the People taking hostages in the Sulu Celebesi Sea were actually financed by terrorist organizations in the Philippines or abroad. You could actually go after those persons for financing terrorism because hostage taking is a terrorism under that 19th so that convention. Hostages convention says the person who sees or detains or threatens to kill compel a third party to do something or abstain from doing something, it's a, convey, it's a violation under that convention. Sue is you exercise, seize or exercise control over a ship or perform an act of violence, which endangers safety. Financing of terrorism, you provide or collect funds for any of the purposes of the other convention. So all of them could be applicable, they could be a additional weapons in the arsenal of the country trying to control these activities in Southeast Asia. To date, uh, everybody's a party to hostages except Indonesia, party to Sua, neither Indonesia nor Malaysia or Thailand. Maybe Thailand is now, they were looking at it. Financing of terrorism, all are parties. Uh, conclusions are there's no new grounds for interdicting ships at sea. Under these conventions, they provide quasi-universal jurisdiction based on presence of the offender in your territory. But they could be a very effective tool against certain of the types of acts that threaten commercial shipping in Southeast Asia, but they can't be effective until everybody in the neighborhood becomes a party. Uh, there's also a ASEAN countries have endorsed the counterterrorism convention. There's a 207 ASEAN convention on it, establishing a framework. My conclusions quickly so I can meet my 20 minute deadline. The 88 Sioux and the 79 conventions could be additional tools to combat inc incidents of hostage taking. If the, uh, and some of the incidents of attacks for piracy purposes. If the attack is treated as an offense under one of these conventions, uh, it lessens the importance of where the attack took place. ASEAN's recognized the importance of the uh, UN conventions. Major challenges is to convince Indonesia that it's in its interest to ratify the 70 had two conventions. Now, the Indonesians were the victims of some of the hostage taking in the Sulu Celebes, so perhaps they would understand now that this could be an advantage to everybody having that additional tool in their toolbox in order to start combat those attacks on ships. Members of the Quad and other developed countries should provide assistance to the ASEAN countries uh, so they can better maintain security in their waters. Japan has a long history of providing assistance to safeguard shipping in the, in the Southeast Asia, and they provided vessels and training to some of the states. The other issue is the overlapping EZ claims and China's claim to sovereign rights and jurisdiction. Part of the problem there is you've got some very tricky issues where the boundaries are not defined and there's overlapping claims and therefore it becomes special problems of international maritime crimes. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Peckman. Uh, as I said, uh, this uh, questions uh, will be raised after we first listen to all four panelists. <laughs> 
Uh, next panelist is uh, Professor uh, David Letts of Australian National University. He will speak about Australian perspective on navigation rights and law enforcement. You have also 20 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Pack. And uh, thank you also to the organizers for inviting me to speak and provide um, my Australian perspective, I should make it very clear that um, I'm speaking um, from my perspective as opposed to uh, anything that the Australian government might um, choose to say on this topic. So um, these comments that I'm making um, are certainly not um, official in the sense that there's any endorsement from the Australian government. Um, I'm also very selfishly using material here that um, is going to make the um, basis of the paper that we've all been uh, asked to make uh, after the, the conference uh, concludes. And, um, and so in that sense, there might be some matters that I gloss over um, as opposed to other matters that I spend a little bit more time on. But I'm, I'm trying to adopt a practical approach to, to look at these issues. And uh, a bit like um, Professor Beckman just um, went through there, really to um, try, and, try and see how Australia has dealt with some of these issues um, from an operational perspective. And to some extent that reflects my background where some of the issues that I'll talk about, um, I had some personal involvement um, with. So I've been asked to talk about navigation rights and law enforcement. I thought, well, we might have to talk a little bit about, well, what are these rights? Is there some commonality in understanding about those? What are the major ingredients that exist with law enforcement from a jurisdictional perspective, but also perhaps from the, the level of force that can be used in law enforcement, and then shift reasonably abruptly to some case studies, for want of a better word, of where um, Australia has put these into, uh, into practice. And some of these will be familiar, no doubt, to many in the audience. Uh, and then uh, I'll try and get some conclusions. But uh, if I don't get too far there, um, that's fine because I'm... Um, very, uh, very open to whatever comments uh, you might, uh, the audience may choose to make in relation to uh, whether Australia has or has not complied with um, the law of the sea or possibly um, had a forward leaning approach that has led to the development of some areas of the law of the sea as well. So by way of um, introduction and background, um, navigation rights, um, these are all listed in, in the Law of the Sea Convention um, itself. And for those states that aren't party to the convention, I think all of these are recognised as matters of customary international law. However, the extent to which the understanding of these rights uh, is common between and among states varies. And this is no, uh, there's no better example of this than uh, in our region, as we'll uh, see in a little while. We've got the zones there and then the applicable um, navigation uh, schemes that apply in each zone that I've listed there on the slide. Uh, there'll be no great surprise to anyone in this audience about either the zones or the um, applicable navigation um, schemes that, that arise in either zone. Um, but as I said, it'll be then a question of interpretation as to precisely where those take us. Um, the passage regimes themselves um, all apply to ships, of course. Some apply to aircraft as well. Some invoke the concept of normal mode, whatever that means, and there's um, if, if you like, there, there's, I suppose, what you could call a, a, a widely held understanding of what you, uh, normal mode might mean. But there's some states uh, and commentators, for that matter, who have a different view. And, um, and there's also, going back to Winnison Passage at the top of that slide, there's also some questions about whether uh, 
warships enjoy that right per se, or whether it's a right that accompanies limitations uh, with it as well. And of course, aircraft, um, there's no innocent passage right for aircraft. In terms of jurisdiction, um, the ability to actually enforce the various uh, laws that exist in the maritime zones, the maritime um, domain itself presents its own uh, unique challenges from the sense that um, the ordinary principles of uh, international law dealing with jurisdiction are overlaid on maritime zone issues that are established under the Royal Sea Convention, customary international law, which briefly equate to areas where the coastal state has sovereignty, areas where the coastal state has sovereign rights, and other areas where there's rights that exist for um, all states under the um, auspices, perhaps, of the high seas freedoms that exist under Article um, 89 and Article 90. Uh, and noting, of course, we've got that unique uh, little jurisdictional zone under the Law of the Sea Convention, the contiguous zone, where there's that slightly different um, bit of jurisdiction that exists, I believe, um, due to the uh, efforts of people in uh, uh, Devon and Cornwall. Um, Dave Goddard might be able to assist me with this, but they're all pirates, the people who live in that, that part of the world, as I understand, and have a long history of um, um, trying to induce vessels to uh, uh, get into the coastline when uh, they're not landing craft. So, um, so we've got those, those sort of zones. Coupled with all of that, we've got specific use of force issues at sea that are quite distinct as well. And that's important to note. It's not the same as um, use of force in the land environment. It's just different because of the maritime ex um, um, domain's uniqueness. Primarily conducted within an international law environment. And then you've got overlapping international law quite distinct from what you would ordinarily get in the land environment. And so that's an important um, aspect to note. Now, on this slide, if, if we we're in the lecture theatre, I would have a prize for um, those who are able to um, discern the three vessels here on the slide and be able to tell me what the use of force issues that come from each vessel are. I can help you. I'll put the, um, the, the arrow on this vessel. This is the I'm Alone. This vessel here is the Red Crusader. And this vessel here, as best I can tell, purports to be a depiction of the Sega, the MV Sega. And that's one that um, I can occasionally have some difference of opinion with people about. But each one of these vessels has been part of the fabric of developing the principles that relate to use of force at sea. And I'm not going to say anything further about that um, at the moment because I think um, many in the audience understand where that um, takes us. So let's get into the substance um, in the remaining 10 minutes or thereabouts that I've got of what I want to talk about. So Australia's approach to military law, uh, sorry, to maritime law enforcement. Let's have a look at some of this. I'm going to start with a little bit about um, our approach in Australia to the unauthorised arrival by, by people by boat at sea. I'm being reasonably careful about the language I'm using. This slide just shows the shift, I suppose, that has existed in the way Australia has dealt with this. And this is a slide I've used in many presentations around the world that shows some of this. The nice man, it was always the nice man in those days, um, who would welcome the people who were trying to come to Australia, point them towards, the, the Navy would help some of this, please go into this nice port, a nice man will help you and everyone will look after you fine. However, things changed a little bit in Australia's case and things changed with this um, island here, Christmas Island, and this vessel, which um, I, again, I think would be familiar to many of you, the vessel Tampa, which um, was on its way um, to Singapore, in fact. It was, it was uh, mentioned already of Australia's huge SAR zone. Um, 
this vessel, when it picked up the people here on the vessel, was actually not in Australia's SAR zone at all. It was in Indonesia's SAR zone um, and very close to the Indonesian coast. But um, the people who, who were picked up and rescued from the um, distress that they were in by this Norwegian flag vessel made it very clear to the captain that they didn't want to go back to the uh, country they just left and they wanted to head towards Australia. And I think many of you would be aware that just before the events of September um, 2001, this event unfolded in Australia's um, northern um, environs. And so Tampa um, was tasked to rescue these people. It did. It was then denied entry into Australia's um, territorial sea. Um, eventually, um, the vessel was boarded by Australian military forces and all the persons who'd been rescued by Tampa um, were transferred to an Australian vessel and they were eventually taken to um, the island of Nauru. For those who um, aren't aware of the geography, Christmas Island is well to the west of Australia, Nauru is well to the east. And if you think about that diagram that Dave put up about the Indonesian archipelago, it's about the same distance from um, where we were going, Christmas Island to Nauru. And this, um, this raised a number of critical issues for Australia, the conditions of the passengers on board, what rights Australia had in terms of interfering with the, um, the uh, interfering, intercepting um, the vessel, was the vessel actually in distress? Was everything Australia was doing uh, in conformity with the Law of the Sea Convention? Who determined the conditions on board the vessel, the master, the flag state, um, or does the coastal state have something to say uh, about this as well? So these were all fundamental issues that Australia had to deal with. The next case study I want to look at is one that Australia um, was involved in in the uh, late uh, 80s, early, uh, sorry, late 90s, early 2000s. And it's to do with this delightful item, the Patagonian toothfish, sometimes uh, dressed up as the Chilean sea bass. If you see it on the restaurant's menu, uh, it's the same animal. But it, it's worth a fortune. And Australia had a lot of experience in the late um, 90s, early 2000s, including some of the longest hot pursuits. Well, I use the term hot um, guardedly, six to eight knots when a vessel is potentially, a warship's potentially capable of around 30 is not that hot. But nevertheless, we had a lot of a lot of vessels in our EEZ in the sub-Antarctic territories. Um, and you can see the various vessels, some of the vessels, the flag states involved um, here. And um, the areas involved in the sub-Antarctic territories, um, Heard Island and McDonald Island over here, Macquarie Island here, all south of 50 degrees, um, so well into the sub-Antarctic areas. And it raised a whole bunch of legal issues for us, a whole bunch of re legal issues. What um, could the RAN, the Navy, actually do, given some of the limitations from the Antarctic Treaty? If we're in sub-Antarctic, perhaps not an issue. Escorting vessels across the high seas once you've apprehended them, how's that consistent with the right of um, high seas passage that exists? We had this long, hot pursuit, Operation T-Bone. All of these operations had a rather unique name. This one was called T-Bone, and it involved for the first time the cooperation of the Australian Defence Force and the South African National Defence Force. And we actually sent some um, Australian military personnel, sailors and soldiers, across to South Africa to intercept the vessel, which had been um, initially uh, apprehended and the pursuit commenced just out, just inside, I should say, just inside Heard Island and McDonald Island's EEZ. So a very long, hot pursuit, as you can see, and here's the timings. Intercepted on the 29th of March, finally boarded 12th of April, finally sailed back to Fremantle on the 5th of May. So the vessels got all the way across here. And it wasn't actually the longest pursuit we did, because a little while later, another one was pursued out there into the Atlantic Ocean. But it raised a whole bunch of issues for us. 
Closer to home, we've also had some criminal law issues. We had this vessel here, the Pong Su, which was a, a vessel of interest to a number of states in the region. It was Tuvalu flagged, but it was North Korean interests. And this vessel raised issues of criminal um, apprehension of a vessel inside the territorial sea and then eventually in the EEZ as well. Um, the vessel was intercepted eventually by the Australian Navy with um, uh, army uh, assistance. Uh, it was, th there were a number of criminal issues from the vessel, including um, a, a dead body that ended up on the uh, Australian coastline in Victoria. There was a continuous pursuit involving police and military uh, vessels and aircraft, and eventually the boarding that, that, we, that we see there. But ordinarily, of course, there's very limited basis upon um, which boarding of a vessel and apprehension of a vessel can take place in the territorial sea for breach of criminal law. So, so questions arise um, or arose out of that um, as well. And, and then final couple of issues. Look, very quickly, Australia has been involved in the proliferation security initiative, which arose out of this boarding from the So San in 2002. We've been involved in exercises uh, in recent years. For those who aren't aware of the PSI, it, it's sort of a club. It's, 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 it's not creating, in fact, go to this, this, uh, this slide. It doesn't create new legal obligations, but it's sort of a club where states agree that they will cooperate according to um, interdiction principles. And, um, and that's another area, I suppose, that Australia has engaged in um, law enforcement activity. The final one that I briefly want to talk about is Australia and um, its involvement with um, sanctions against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Um, again, primarily um, sanction involvement under the auspices of Operation Argos, involving, involving both um, Navy assets and air assets. And these slides just give some um, elements of that from Defence Department uh, press releases. Um, we continue to be involved in that, uh, those operations uh, reasonably recently, last year and indeed uh, again this year as well. And then out of all of that, um, Australia then, I suppose by way of some concluding remarks, um, we certainly openly state that we are abiding by whatever the rules-based international order sets up, whatever that is. We push boundaries on occasions, law of the sea boundaries, um, but we are in involved in global efforts to reinforce the norms that are based on a conventional reading of the 1982 convention. And that's, I, I suppose, the, the ending point for where Australia tries to situate itself in terms of the law enforcement activities across a broad range of, of areas that Australia has been involved in. So with that, I think that's my 20 minutes, Judge, and I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Letts. Uh, Next and final speaker uh, for this panel is uh, Professor um, Kyo Arai of uh, Graduate School and Faculty of Law, Toshisha University in Kyoto. Uh, he will speak about uh, uh, the title of uh, his presentation is Do We Still Need the Expansionist Revisionist Theory of Self-Defense at Sea? Uh, may I invite uh, Professor Arai? Thank you very much, Judge, Judge Peck. Um, my paper today relates to how we should justify the practice of maritime interception operations, MIO, partly referred by uh, my previous speaker, Professor Letts, um, this operation was conducted on the high seas against suspected ships sailing under foreign flags, which has been conducted as a part of the war on terror after 
Some states and scholars have advocated an expansive interpretation of self-defense for a sweeping legal basis for MIO in cases where the other laws, such as the law of armed conflict, including Ply's law or peacetime law of the sea, do not give a sufficient legal ground to do so, or those laws are totally inapplicable. However, my conclusion is that such an approach is invalid and necessary, at least now. And also from a policy perspective, it is inadvisable for maintaining the free and open maritime order in the 2020s. Let me start with the definition. Since 2001, there has been strong advocacy for the expansionist theory of self-defense. In this paper, this expansionist theory is defined as a tendency to argue, first, self-defense against a non-state armed group in the territory of another state is legally permissible. Second, this is the case even if the territorial state does not effectively control such group, but may have failed to constrain the group's function due to negligence, unwillingness, or incapacity. Third, necessity and proportionality are measured against the threat by that group, but it is done in a concertina-like quality that is flexibly manipulatable. At the same time, there is also a revisionist theory, a camp that goes one step further regarding the reach of self-defense. This approach was generated by this paragraph in Harold Honju Ko's speech in 2010. Based on this single conjunction highlighted here, that is or, it was claimed that the United States could use force for self-defense without being part of an armed conflict. Consequently, under this theory, both the resort to armed force and the execution of specific operations shall be regulated by the use of verum only, precluding using barrel assessment and strict regulation for the use of force based on human rights law. In short, this approach produces the legal black hole where neither human rights law nor the law of armed conflict applies. This expansive or revisionist interpretation of the law of self-defense was also asserted in the maritime domain for justifying the MIO widely. As to the maritime interception in the initial phase of the war on Taylor, Captain O'Rourke of the US Navy advised that Article 51 of the UN Charter has come to be accepted as the primary basis for such operations. The problem is whether this applied long after the immediate terrorist threat ceased the revisionists says it is possible. Indeed, we can find the self-defense self justification for MIO in the United States military doctrines like the 2007 Commander's Handbook shown here. This paragraph looks straightforward, but leading in conjunction with the other justifications listed here, its meaning is unclear. Notably, the relationship between the belligerent lights and the self-defense argument is ambiguous. Suppose one state resort to self-defense action, and it constitutes an armed conflict. 
In that case, the maritime operation shall be conducted on the basis of the law of armed conflict. And we don't need a separate justification based on the right of self-defense. So following the principle of effective interpretation, this paragraph shall be given a distinctive meaning that applies to situations other than armed conflict. This perfectly mirrors what Harold Cole suggested. Some scholars support this interpretation. Professor Heinz von Heineck commented in 2010 that this light may be an op operable legal basis for MIO. Commander Dr. Fink of the Netherlands commented more directly in 2018. States could act against non-state actors on foreign flag vessels if a flag state is unable or unwilling to act to remedy the situation. In that context, the doctrine is tempting because it allows the boarding to foreign vessels without the consent of the flag state. He additionally pointed out that it could bypass the con controversial legal question of whether the law of naval warfare applies in non-international armed conflict. Under this revisionist self-defense approach, the MIO started in the context of international armed conflict may be legal regardless of whether the conflict class conflict classification changed afterwards, like operation enduring freedom. This point may be the one to which this camp of the David wanted to push the envelope. Here is the reason. The war against terrorism, terrorism is now classified as a non-international armed conflict, where the law of naval warfare has been underdeveloped or it is executed in a gray, legal gray zone where the applicable rules are shaky. Therefore, advocating the revisionist theory of self-defense at sea is not just claiming that a series of interceptions shall be recognized as necessary and proportionate self-defense to a specific terrorist threat. It aims at more generally asserting a sweeping justification, blurring the bifurcation of use of force paradigms into the peacetime law enforcement and wartime belligerent actions. However, we should, pay, we, we, we should pay attention to the same documents recently being updated with more nuance. The 2017 edition of the Commander's Handbook had two additions to the previous edition. The first is the term national self-defense, and the second is a phrase as recognized in Article 51 of the UN Charter. The text itself does not clarify the intention of this new paragraph. Still, it is safe to say that the emphasis on national self-defense and Article 51 of the UN Charter would not go along with the direction the revisionist camp has pursued. Professor Heinzer von Heineck also took a more nuanced position shown here in his comment to the 2015 edition of the same Operation Law Handbook, substantially limiting his statement in the previous edition. My next point is that such assertion of a self-defense justification is not novel. Christian Thomas pointed out whether states can use force in self-defense against non-state actors abroad is not a new issue that suddenly became relevant after 
The same applies to the maritime sphere. Charter and law introduced states' attempt to advocate exceptional measures to interfere with foreign ships on the high seas on the grounds of self-defense, with some examples. The first and most referred example is the Virginia's incident of 1873. There, Spain seized on the high seas an American ship carrying American and British nationals and many weapons for using in the Cuban insurrection. Great Britain accepted that the arrest was justified on the ground of self-defense, but the United States did not. Some scholars refer to this case as supportive evidence for the self-defense argument, but the reality is that this British reaction was isolated and firmly opposed. Professor Jider concluded that this was pretended to be recognized. The second example is the French practice during the Algerian war. At that time, France asserted allied to visit and search on the ships of on the high seas, suspected, suspected of supporting Algerians based on the light of self-defense. However, the flag states strongly opposed this policy. As Professor Michael Baez concluded, the state practice and opinion juries generated by opposition to the French policy would still militate against the existence of an extended light of self-defense on the high seas. However, in fact, all these debates have been already settled in the past. In my opinion, the International Law Commission 19, 1956, in a discussion of the High Seas Convention, considered the, 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 the right to board a vessel committing hostile acts to the intervening state at the time of imminent danger. But the Commission did not recognize this right, mainly because of the vagueness of terms like imminent danger and hostile acts that are open to abuse. Furthermore, Professors O'Connor and Sheila concluded that self-defense is an insecure foundation to qualify the freedom of the sea, for it could lend plausibility to things that would not sustain the balance of interests of the international community. So, state practice before 2001 shows that there was no overall acceptance of the self-defense exception to the exclusive flag state jurisdiction for the vessels on the high seas. Turning to the 21st century, how should we evaluate 20 years practice. Dr. Fink reported a US DOD organization's opinion in 2005, saying that through accepted practice and custom, the MIO has, be, has developed a new legal regime under which warships may intercept foreign ships without resorting to belligerent lights. This expansion is now West, well, well established through over 10 years of continuous and challenged operations. Professor Klein contrasts this new practice against the previous one with far less acceptance. However, careful examination of the case overshadows such claims. From the outset, the participating states to the MIO have different views on the legal basis for the operation. Captain Oru qualified his assertion that the light of self-defense is the primary basis for the MIO by saying that as time passes, the question will loom larger 
and larger. He seems to believe in a customary rule permitting the continuance of DMIO, but his conclusion at that time to this question was only time will tell. Comments by his colleagues in the allied country, like UK and Canada, materialized Captain O'Rourke's concern. According to the UK's statement shown here, use of force by, by maritime, maritime units shall be done within the peacetime laws of the sea. The UK was simply not prepared to invoke the light of self-defense for such boardings without seeking flag state approval. The comment was recorded in 2003. Not only as of the policy statement, but this position was also reflected in the operational maneuver in much later examples. In Operation Active Endeavor, which lasted until 2016 in the Mediterranean Sea, the MIO was declared to be an Article 5 collective self-defense operation of the NATO treaty. However, in reality, the boarding took place only when both flag state and the master consented. As Professor Heinzer von Heineck admitted, the practice of participating, participating state to MIO was quite diverse and has not contributed to the emergence of agreed upon criteria. Additionally, based on research of the national manuals collected by the Stockton Center, it is revealed that recent manuals like that of Denmark in 2020 or New Zealand in 2019 have maintained the clear bifurcation structure of naval warfare based on the law of armed conflict, including the San Remo Manual on the one hand, and maritime law enforcement regulated by the anchors on the other hand. There is no indication of overarching justification of self-defense for MYOs. So the reality is that even the states advocating the self-defense argument obscured their own position, trying to secure the alternative ways, such as a bilateral agreement with or ad hoc consent of the flag states. On the other hand, opposition states make a rather clear statement against such an approach. So these could not be an indication of the recognition of a new customary rule. Even if this sweeping justification by self-defense is attractive for the operational purpose, my conclusion is that it is unnecessary and inadvisable, both from the normative and policy perspective. Firstly, any claims based on self-defense are in nature insecure, provisional, and supplementary. So at best, it could be a second best basis only. When any alternative cause is available, that will fade from the front stage and remaining an exceptional measure. Secondly, from a policy perspective, we should recall the conclusion of Professor O'Connor again. Self-defense would not sustain the balance of interests of the international community. Admittedly, years just after 9-11, this balance of interest seemingly leaned towards the expansionist direction. However, 20 years after, we should readjust it to the point Professor O'Connor said. In the 2020s, we face other challenges affecting the balance of interests such as hybrid warfare conducted at sea by sovereign states. Certain states using hybrid warfare strategies to annoy law-abiding states by 
intentionally obscuring the legal nature of their own actions. So it is such states that blurring the clear bifurcation of use of force paradigms would benefit most. So the thing is that the sweeping national security exception could pave the road to the hazardous attempt by states, ruining the cardinal principles of the law of the sea based on vague reasons, such as self-preservation or protection of sovereignty. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Arai. Uh, now we have about uh, 20 minutes for discussion. Uh, um, we have received uh, five questions uh, through uh, this uh, chatting uh, app. And uh, I don't know whether panelists are aware of those questions, uh, but uh, just for the benefit of the audience, uh, I may briefly uh, repeat the questions uh, raised. The first question by Prof, uh, Peter Bowers, uh, I think this is the question to uh, Bob, uh, Professor Beckman. Uh, have there been examples of Indonesia purporting to execute boarding and law enforcement action against uh, uh, any activity in their exclusive economic zone on a domestic law basis of armed robbery at sea, excluding a piracy construction, and how this has been received. So, uh, Bob? I'm not aware of any cases like that. I think Indonesia, <clears throat> again, there could be, I'm just not aware of it. Indonesia is more concerned of in its economic or in its uh, <clears throat> economic zone of illegal fishing. IAU fishing is their number one priority. I don't have any uh, basis for them trying to arrest vessels uh, in economic zone based on uh, the idea that it's although it's not piracy, it's armed robbery against ships. I think they would probably say only the flag state has jurisdiction. Maybe just I, I ask a quick question to you relating to this one. Is there any example of uh, this uh, request for uh, either prosecute or ex extradite? No, because the states have not looked at the SUA convention or the hostages convention as possible vehicles for resolving this problem. But again, that's based on presence of the offender. Uh, there have been, a, there was one case in which there was a hijacking of a ship, I think flying a Malaysian flag and was taken to the Philippines. Philippines was a party to the convention. I believe at the time they had not passed their implementing legislation. So it wasn't possible for either the flag state of Malaysia to, re to do a extradite or prosecute request. So this is, a, this is a gap which I think is not a threat to the coastal states because it's based on presence of the offender in their territory that they could be utilizing. We've done a study of some of the incidents in the South, in the Southeast Asia to see whether events that were classified as armed robbery of ships may also have been a sewer offense or a hostage taking offense, which would trigger an obligation uh, to arrest if the offenders are present in your territory. The difficulty is Indonesia has not decided at this point to ratify either of those conventions because they represent so much of the sea area, they're a key player. They are, I think. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, I think this question also goes to Bob, but uh, if uh, any other panelist wants to join, please, uh, you are welcomed. Uh, 
Uh, question is, uh, is there any movement, movement by states to expand SUA convention approach to hostile action against submarine cable? Uh, I started to, I, I attempted to start a movement and it fell, everybody ignored me. Uh, there's an article in, the, in a book on, a handbook on submarine cables in which I argued that Submarine cables are critically important communications infrastructure. Any attack by private persons to attack them should be a offense just like destroying airport facilities or navigational facilities. But the uh, idea has not been picked up by the international community. My own view on this is in part because there is no UN organization that would be responsible. It is responsible for submarine cables and would be pushing that. I should say also there's increasing recognition that submarine cables, which communications cables, which cover 98% of communications now, the critical infrastructure is very important that everybody served by that cable has an interest in protecting it. There's recent report of the, to the, by the UK parliament, I think to the defense department or defense department to the parliament. There's a recent study by CIS, CSIS. Australia has the most advanced legislation. They've seen the issue first, but most of the international community still thinks their handphones are it's all by satellite communication, not by uh, submarine cable. So we're working on it, but no, no movement. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Professor Peck, can I can I just add to what Bob's just said that um, I, I think this is an issue that um, it's certainly been talked about in various circles that I've been for the last few. Well, I haven't been anywhere for the last year, but. Um, for, for a year or so before that, um, and there's recognition that there are serious deficiencies in terms of the jurisdiction to deal with people who interfere with submarine cables. As um, Professor Beckman indic indicated, 98% um, or thereabouts of traffic is, is through submarine cables. And the, the um, other, other compelling issue with submarine cables is that th there's no doubt where they are. There's no secrecy about where they are. You don't want your average weekend fisherman putting down his anchor and pulling up the the, the one transcontinental cable that, that comes into your country. So so there are there are serious weaknesses in terms of the the legal mechanism of dealing with submarine cables and and the attempts that states are, are presently not seriously enough taking to um, to keep those safe, so I think I think this is this is a sleeper issue, but it's it's a, it's emerging very very quickly. Thank you. Uh, uh, third question is I think this is question to you, uh, Professor Letts. Uh, what is the most significant aspect in which use of force at sea differs from the use of force on land? What particular principles of international law serves? as the basis for that difference? Um, thank you for the question. I, I, look, I, I think the, the fundamental issue is that it's, an inter, it's primarily an international legal environment in which um, use of force issues are taking place at sea. It's simply ordinarily not the case on land because law enforcement activities on land are typically within the sovereign territory of whichever state those activities are taking place. Whereas in the maritime environment, um, you could have law enforcement activities taking place within an area like the territorial sea, where the coastal state does have sovereignty or archipelagic waters. But you can also have legitimate law enforcement activities taking place within an exclusive economic zone, the EEZ, where um, you're 150 nautical miles away from the land territory and where the coastal state has sovereign rights but doesn't have sovereignty. So it just it, it's, it's a fundamentally different paradigm in terms of the way in which law enforcement activities are taking place in terms of the multiple actors that are interested in how those activities occur. So I think they're the, they're the 
the key elements of difference between the land environment and the maritime environment for, for those types of activities. Thank you. If I could, um, if yes, I could uh, please. just um, chip in on that one. Um, I think one of the most significant differences, uh, if we're talking about peacetime um, uh, uh, use of force during uh, pe peacetime operations, um, is through the human rights lens. Um, the the um, uh, while the law of the sea has incorporated human rights norms, and it's and it's the 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 um, incorporation of the um, uh, fundamental considerations of humanity by. Uh, by 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 ITLOS and other um, uh, uh, tribunals, that is that is that has led to the uh, the the uh, uh, incorporation of, of of a necessity and proportionality requirement in the law of the sea. Um, that can be contrasted to to situations typically in a state's own territory, certainly in, in, in its own land territory, where its use of force, certainly state use of force, is is undoubtedly governed by human rights considerations. So that is not only requirements of necessity and proportionality, but often much more um, developed frameworks for the use of force, um, uh, which include obligations to to uh, plan and resource. Um, uh, operations effectively um, to investigate uh, uh, potential breaches of uh, the right to life afterwards. If you're in a situation at sea when those obligations also apply, then I think I would argue that there is actually little, if any, difference between the legal regime that 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 applies. The the challenge though is is determining those situations at sea where that is the case. Um, and, and I think that's, a, that's the, 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 the area of difficulty that, that I was trying to, to uh, draw out. Uh, uh, that's thank, Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. I think uh, this question goes to Professor Arai. Uh, merchant marine crews have a right to self-defense on their ships to repel pirates or robbers at sea as a matter of historical customary practice, most recently used successfully against pirates of Somalia. Isn't this practice part of the effective solution to deter and prevent piracy? To some extent, uh, Bob as well, Professor Beckman as well, but uh, Professor Arai first. Okay. <clears throat> From my perspective, um, probably I can answer partly to this question. Um, I discuss about the self-defense at sea, but the, the main point, the main focus was on the, the maritime in, in, in interdiction, I mean, visit and search operations for the, 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 new, the, the third party uh, ships um, and its cargo based on the, the, the uh, I mean, the reason the reason of such operation was is you know suspects su I mean suspects about the 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 they are carrying the the, the very uh, hazardous items or or potential terrorists or something about that. So basically, uh, I I I didn't discuss about the personal individual uh, act act of self defense uh, in case of the very imminent danger to the crews of merchant vessels or probably a, the, the danger against the crew of warships uh, participating to that a, a operations. My, 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 my argument does not affect such, you know, individuals, I mean, natural right to act against the, the threat by some someone a uh, piracy or armed rovers at sea that's my question thank you uh, as i understand it i may be wrong uh, self defense professor arai uh, referred to uh, was uh, self defense as a right of state uh, on the customary international as well as on the Article 51 of Charter of United Nations, I guess. 
Uh, okay. Uh, now, I, one more know, question to... I can uh, comment on that yes, piracy uh, issue. I think, it, practically speaking, armed guards did help solve the piracy problem in the Gulf of Aden, but it's not a magic bullet. It partly was because the IMO worked with the shipping industry and they put guidelines in, but it's not a solution in areas like Southeast Asia because it's, it's okay to carry weapons. It's now governed by the law of the flag state when you're outside territorial sovereignty, but the illegal issues become complex when you're in territorial waters and especially when you come into port. And therefore, uh, it, is, it is not a simple solution for all acts. It was in Somalia, generally it's not. Could I just, we, I'm sorry for, I'd like to make one comment that relates to Professor uh, Arise, and that's, I think what he should look at a little bit is the 205 Sua Convention, which was the after 9-11 to deal with maritime terrorism, including what, carrying of weapons of mass destruction by sea. And after a long debate of three years at the IMO, the flag state principle of flag state consent before boarding remained the operative uh, norm. And I think, therefore, scholars trying to argue, well, let's try to get around this issue by uh, giving a expansive view of self-defense, I think perhaps is not the best approach to the problem. Okay. Uh, another question to Professor Arai. What is the difference between maritime uh, interdiction operation and maritime interception operations? Both are named as MIO by different scholars. Professor Arai? Okay. Um, the simple question is, no difference. <laughs> I, mean, um, I know, I know that, that, that many scholars use different, you know, words. Uh, the, the different names for MIOs. Um, so, uh, yes, um, someone used inter, interdiction instead of interception. But you know, in my understand, in my understanding, those interception, those words, interception and interdiction, could ca have been used in a mutually exchangeable. Exchangeable, I, I think. For, at least from the perspective of the, 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 the international law of the sea, I think. Um, if there are, there is any, there are any, there is any difference between those two terms, you know, probably how each term sound, you know, I, I, I'm not I, I'm not a, a native English speaker, so I, I, I don't understand the detail of the meaning of two words, but probably interception means lightly than interdiction in maritime operation. But in reality, probably there is no difference between two terms. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think uh, next question goes also to Professor Arai, uh, but uh, anybody <laughs> can join. In the case of unmanned surface and subsurface vessels, how can consent of the flag state for boarding be obtained in practical terms, or are these vessels immune from boarding? Yes. <laughs> Theoretically speaking, you know, even if uh, even those unmanned surface or uh, subsurface vessels have something to indicate that by themselves the, the 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 nationality. I mean the flag, state, or other information about uh, whether it is public ships or private owned ships. Without that, you know. No one can understand the, the status of such a man big vessel. So probably uh, if they have some you know signals of such information, you know, probably you can board in, in accordance with the consent of that signaled state. But if there is no such signals, so probably under the the, the uncross, 
you can you can treat such vessels as a non-nationality vessels, probably. So it is open to be boarded by other states. I, I'm very sorry about the, the, the such you know theoretical answer. I I I I'm not so sure about the 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 you know the actual operation mm. against such a man vehicle. Okay. Answer, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh final question goes to uh, Professor Letts, I think this is uh, similar to previous question. Anyway, are there any concrete examples of different application of the use of force on land and at sea? For example, in Japan, the general rule of use of force on land is referred to and mutatis mutandis applied to the use of force at sea. I think there's... Um... I think there's some commonalities, but um, we also see uh, differences that exist. And if you take um, a case such as the, um, let's say the Sega number two, so that, that case um, at Itlos, where the circumstances are just so distinct from what you would see in a land environment in terms of the methodology that's used, the, the way with the boarding took place, um, even, even the way the weapons in that case were discharged by those that were boarding, it's, it, it's almost incomprehensible um, and, I, and I, I just can't think of a comparable situation in the land environment where a similar um, activity has taken place to affect a law enforcement activity in that way. Um, the, um, and, the, and the other point, of course, as you've indicated, Judge, back, back to what I talked about before, is, is that the relevant legal operating environment is going to be usually a different environment. In, in the case of maritime, it's going to be predominantly international law not just the law of the sea, but there may be other elements as we've heard about today. It could be international human rights law. It could be uh, international humanitarian law in some circumstances, um, but certainly it's going to be an international law environment with different states involved. Whereas in the land environment, it's almost invariably going to be a jurisdictional issue that will rest with the um, state that has sovereignty over that land territory. So, so I think they're the they're the key differences that that exist. And, and of course, we have some useful jurisprudence for the level of force that can be applied in the maritime environment through those cases that um, I didn't go into in detail. But um, I'm sure that we're many many here or most here are familiar with. Thank you. I have a quick question to Dr. Uh, Goda. Uh, as he didn't receive as many questions yes, no, no, as no, others. <laughs> so to be fair, uh, this idea of effective control over spaces at sea uh, as a basis of jurisdictional link, how this idea go along with uh, this uh, 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 free, uh, this uh, principle of uh, uh, high sea? that high seas are open uh, to all states. So that's I the, think, yeah, please. I think that's, I think that's an, a very important point. Um, the, the, the notion, um, so, so one concrete example that has been proposed is that the, the multinational force conducting counter piracy operations in the Indian Ocean were exercising effective control over their area of, of, of operations because there were there were so many warships they had sufficient uh, influence over that area of the oceans that they um, effectively controlled it. Um, I don't buy that at all, partly because I think even even with a lot of warships, um, there's still a huge amount of water between between each of them. But I think um, the the 
the notion that that they could have effectively controlled that area of water is fundamentally a tension with uh, their limited jurisdiction um, under the law of the sea. So I I struggle to reconcile the the freedom of navigation of other vessels to which there are very limited exceptions in the case, for example, of piracy that they were there to tackle with the idea that that they would have uh, sufficient control over um, the 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 whole gamut of of rights that would that would apply if you followed the 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 logic that they were exercising effective control so um, i follow that logic to 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 really be very skeptical of the idea that that um, states could really ever effectively control areas of the sea beyond their their uh, uh, territorial sea, and why I think it's it's much more sensible to look to the personal models of um, jurisdiction. But thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this will uh, conclude second panel on uh, navigation rights and law enforcement. I want to thank all four panelists for their excellent presentation. Although it was on online, uh, we had a quite interactive session. And uh, I'm sure uh, audience also had enjoyed uh, this uh, lively discussions on this important topic. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, actually, good night. <laughs> and good day for everyone. Bye bye. The session is closed. <laughs>